All you, sir. Okay, let me go ahead and share my screen here. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Let me find the one that I need. I guess it's this one. And there we go. Can everybody see the contract there? Good deal. For those in class, I mean, uh, Robbie did turn the thing around to allow us to try and see you. However, with me sharing my screen, that's pretty big. So if you've got a question, just say, hey, Rick, and that'll work. So it also helps me out not to be looking at the classroom because I'm doing intermittent fasting. And so I'm not allowed to eat for another couple hours and seeing all of y'all with food in there is killing me. Anyway, but uh, so um, just to let you know, some of these paragraphs I might read in full others I'm probably not going to read in full because if I try to read everything in this today we'd be here for hours uh, and I don't think my voice can take that so um, anyway um, let me move you over here so that I can get things moved around right so um, again if you have a question please uh, you know speak right up um, so, Going to start out here, the first paragraph here, uh, or the first part of it, you know, it's, you're going to need to put in the date that you're doing it. Please fill in the seller and, and both the seller and the purchaser. And for the seller, I would take that information off of what's uh, in the tax records. Um, and another thing, just while I'm thinking about it, because I've this has come up multiple times here in the last couple of months. Unfortunately, there are, uh, we've had a few cases not just in Richmond, but in Richmond and uh, some of the Northern Virginia offices of the, the seller dying or one of the parties of the seller dying and the family members just automatically think, well, we can just turn around and sell it ourselves with, you know, and that might not be the case. Um, so before you list a property or, or you know, try and sell it, um, make sure that the person who's trying to sell it has the authority to sell the property and sign the documents and everything. Uh, we had one of the cases up here in Northern Virginia, the person who said they had the authority when, when you know, the attorneys looked at it and everything, they actually did not. So uh, you don't want to be um, you know, trying to sell a property uh, and not really have the authority to. So just wanted to bring that up to you because I have, for some reason, I've seen that multiple times here in the last couple of months. Um, also, this is something that I'm seeing a fair amount. I mean, it's not majority, but where they're not filling in who is a listing broker and who is a selling uh, broker or the selling company. When it says selling broker, that means Keller Williams or Long and Foster or Remax or whatever. Please fill those in. Um, it, it really does help out. The real property, again, go to the tax records and fill in what's there. Um, make sure that the property here is the correct, is the same property that you showed your client um, or that you are listing. Uh, every once in a while, it doesn't happen very often, but every once in a while, the wrong property is put in here and they try and sell the wrong property and that's not a good place to be. So I'll just leave it at that. Um, personal property included. Um, I will go ahead and read this just so that everybody's kind of on the same page included in the sale of the above real estate um, are the shades, plantation shutters, blinds, curtain and drapery rods, screens and screen doors, storm windows and doors, light fixtures, wall to wall carpeting, garbage disposal, range, oven, dishwasher, laundry tubs, attic fan, smoke and heat detectors, awnings, electrical wiring, connections for appliances, ceiling fans, garage door openers and remotes, mailbox and post outbuildings and sheds, gas logs, fireplace inserts, and all other items attached to the real estate and being a part thereof, including all shrubbery and plant uh, plantings on the property. Also included are the following items. So that's where you would put uh, other things. Um, I would say um, one thing that you might, and I don't know, I know I saw Michael's on here and um, we've got some other experienced agents for, um, wall mounted are the 
for wall mounted TVs, I know the TV doesn't convey, but are, are you all seeing the wall mountings convey or are they leaving holes there? I had one a couple of months ago and they, they left those on, on the wall. Okay. They conveyed. They conveyed. So are you all adding that in that they convey? Yes. Okay. Um, just one thing, if they're not, con I mean, I think it's important if also, if they're not conveying, I think put that in there somewhere and you need to, if you're representing the buyer, you need to explain to the buyer, look, uh, there's probably going to be holes in the wall where they took that down. And so, and that those holes were there because that thing was, was mounted there. So any of those things are going to be taken down are going to leave holes and the seller may or may not repair those, but I think it's something to address up front if you can, um, because a lot of buyers, oh my God, look at the holes. Well, what did you expect? There was a, you know, a big old uh, mount thing mounted on the wall there. It's going to leave a little bit of damage. So anyway, just want to bring that up because those are things we hear about. Addenda, um, if, you know, if there is lead-based paint uh, or you know, some type of addenda you're attaching, this is where you would attach what it is. Um, if it's none of the four that are um, spelled out there, then please put in what it is here under other. Uh, purchase price, um, this is where you write out the purchase price. And of course, this is where you write the actual numbers. Um, I will go through this one a little bit because uh, this paragraph uh, is pretty important. I actually had a, not from Richmond, but from one of the other offices, I actually had one about uh, two months ago that they did not have any purchase price or anything filled out and they sent it in as a ratified contract. So they had didn't have how much financing was being done. I don't know how they considered that ratified because nowhere in the contract did I see a purchase price. Um, so anyway, you have to have you know, all the terms in there that you're agreeing to. So please put in the purchase price. This, if you check this box, it's saying that it's not subject to financing um, and purchasers shall pay all cash at closing by bank certified funds or bank wire. Um, you need to, if you're doing this, you need to tell that buyer they're going to have to provide proof that they have that cash on hand. Um, so uh, this box here is the one that's normally checked. This sale is subject to financing. Um, and Michael, if I say something wrong, please step right in and tell me, you know, this contract way better than I do. So anyway. Um, yeah, well, I was going to say with what you just said about it, it with, if you do not fill in the financing, you are basically negating any opportunity for the buyer to get out of the contract based on financing conditions. Cause this is one of your biggest probably outs of the contract and also one of the, light, the longest lasting ones. Yes. Because unlike the Northern Virginia contract, we don't really, basically we're, we're, we have this open until 5 p.m. on the date of settlement, technically. Yes. Yep, you're right. So you have to be very, you know, I can't tell you how many times, this is the section of the contract I see most agents mess up, that they do not put the right information in here. You could, if you check, just conventional or FHA or something like that, and you don't fill anything else in, well, if they can get a conventional loan, which basically means any loan out there, hard money loan at 22% interest, guess what? They have to take that loan. So just think about this. This is one of the probably most complex, but it's really not that hard to fill out. You need this information when it comes to uh, putting together a contract. And this is, and to that point, this is a key reason that one, your buyer ought to be pre-qualified and hopefully they're getting pre-qualified with a lender that you know and that you can talk to so that you can get the information you need to fill this section in. Again, not only is it a conventional FHA, what type of loan, but what's the interest rate um, that you know we should be filling in and those type questions. So, hey, hey. Yeah. Um, uh, Rick and Michael, we have a question from James Jones real quick, if y'all can, uh, he can go ahead and shout that out to you guys. Yeah. I, I just want to, I missed that point that Mike made about 5 p.m. on the day of settlement. What was that piece again? Did you hear that, Michael? Yeah, so Rick might cover that later, but if you look under the financing paragraph, paragraph five or six, 
it says you you the the buyer has to have a loan commitment by 5 p.m. on the day of the settlement. Okay. 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 Now they probably have the loan commitment a week ahead of time. Whenever that closing disclosure is released, they essentially have a loan commitment generally. But so that's where. So really, it's probably more the flip side of that is if they don't have loan commitment, they need to have a rejection letter so that they can then <laughs> get out and get their deposit back, all those type things. So, um, but yeah, it's a huge point about, I mean, you know, it, yeah, if they can afford, if they can qualify at whatever interest rate, you know, and they qualify, yet it's more of a payment than they want to do, they're still stuck in the contract because they qualify for a higher uh, interest rate than they really want to uh, be locked into. So anyway, yeah, let me go ahead and read this and maybe it'll make a little more sense. Yep, go ahead. So this, this sale is subject to financing. This is subject to purchaser being able to obtain or assume. Um, and so you fill it, you would check one of these boxes here um, and that's 99% of the loans are gonna be covered under those four. Uh, loan in the principal amount of and put in the percentage. So, you know, if it's FHA, it's probably a 95% loan. Conventional, it may be 95, it might be, you know, 80%, whatever. Put in a percentage um, of the purchase price or loan amount. I would recommend doing a percentage because then if you change the purchase price, you don't have to calculate what is the loan amount down here. But if you want to put the actual loan amount, you put that here. Um, secured by first deed of trust lien on the property bearing interest at A, and you select. Is it a fixed rate? Um, not exceeding to Michael's point, um, you know, if they're uh, wanting to be somewhere in the threes, well, then not, not exceeding three and a half percent, whatever the case might be. Talk to the lender about that. Or is it an adjustable rate? Again, what uh, interest rate would it be that you don't want it to su succeed or exceed? Or at the prevailing rate of interest at the time of settlement. Um, so if you know if you want to go with this one, then if it goes way up and they can still afford it, that's what it would be. Any questions on that part yet? So uh, to amplify what Rick just said on those three things, we often get questions on which one's the best to choose. The answer for it is it depends. It really depends on where you're at. It depends on where the market is. When I first got into real estate our interest rates were in 12, 14% yep. range. And they would jump or go, they would go up or down a half percentage point or percentage point within days. Yeah, They would move quite a bit. And if you're working with any sort of buyers that are very tight on their money, in our current market, even a, a move of an eighth of a point could make it unaffordable for them. So that's where you have to be very careful with what do you choose here? You know, if you choose the first one, a fixed rate, not exceeding say three and a quarter, well, that's putting, that protects your buyer, but every time you protect your buyer, you weaken your offer. Right. So you got to think through things like that too. Yep. Thank you. That's a great point. So you really do have to look at the market. Uh, and let me just have, what are y'all seeing in the market down there right now? Has it softened a little bit from what it was? Nobody noticing? We're about three days on market. It's about 12 right now, 12, 13 days on market. Okay. Still getting a bunch of multiple offers or? Still getting multiple offers. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's move on here. The loan shall be amortized for a term of normally 30 years, but it might be, you know, these days they've got all different ones um, and shall require not more than a total of blank discount points. And again, that would be something you would be asking the loan officer. Um, the principal amount to be assumed um, will be the outstanding principal balance on the date of settlement. Uh, that is, if it's a, an assumption, purchasers shall assume all obligations of seller under um, such loan with the exception of past due charges for which seller uh, shall be liable. Purchasers shall pay the balance of the purchase price at settlement, less any deposit, loan amount, or other credit set forth in this agreement. Nothing in this agreement prohibits purchaser from seeking financing other than as specified above, so long as settlement is not delayed and there is no cost to seller. Um, purchaser's failure, this is huge right here, 
Purchaser's failure to obtain such alternative financing does not relieve purchaser from the obligations to obtain the financing specified above. So basically, if they checked that they were going to get a conventional loan and the loan officer then says, well, you know what? Hey, FHA might be, you know, there might be an FHA program that, you know, would be better for you. And so the, your buyer says, oh, that sounds great. I'm going to save some money. And they try for that FHA financing and they don't get it. Even if they get that rejection letter, they are still, they still have to try and apply for the conventional and if they're trying to get out of it, they need to get rejected for that conventional financing. Just because they get rejected or whatever for the alternative does not get them out of the contract. Okay. That's why that last line there is, is very important. And some agents don't really understand that. Um, but one other thing about the selection of the type of loan that sometimes you have combinations. So you might uh -huh. have a FHA, VHDA. VA, yep. You need to you need to select both. Yes. Of those. Yep. Thank you. Because that's part of representing what the financing is properly. Yeah. Yeah. VHDA does it piggybacks basically. Yep. <laughs> so um, seller agrees to pay at settlement the sum of blank towards purchasers, closing costs, prepaid discounts, point, discount points, and loan expenses. So um, if there's a seller subsidy, that's where it's going to be. Appraisal, this sale is or is not further subject to properties appraised value equaling or exceeding the purchase price, which value shall be determined by an appraiser selected by purchaser's lender. Uh, if a cash purchase, the appraiser shall be selected by purchaser. The bold part here, the appraisal shall be ordered within 15 days of the date of ratification. It shall be the responsibility of purchaser to advise purchaser's lender of this requirement. If the appraisal is not ordered within 15 days of the date of ratification, then the seller may terminate this agreement by written notice to purchaser and subject to the provisions of paragraph eight. Um, <laughs> purchaser's deposit shall be refunded in full to purchaser and neither party shall have the further any further obligation here under. If the appraisal is ordered after the 15 day period, but seller has not yet terminated this agreement, then seller's right to terminate this agreement for said purpose is waived. So if it's 20 days and that's when the appraisal is finally ordered and on the 21st day, the seller says, I wanna terminate the agreement, they can't do so because you've already ordered it even though it was late. That makes sense? Regarding the appraisal, if the purchase price exceeds the appraised uh, value, which means it didn't appraise, purchasers shall either proceed with consummation of this agreement without regard to the amount of the appraised value or make a written request to seller within five days after receipt of the appraisal um, for a reduction in the purchase price, so long as the reduced purchase price is not lower than the appraised value. And sellers shall have a copy of the appraisal. Um, sellers shall then have five days to respond to the purchaser's request for a reduction in the purchase price. Um, if the parties, and that's called the response deadline, if the parties are unable to agree in writing as to a purchase price within five days following the response deadline, then either the purchaser or seller may terminate this agreement by written notice to the other party and subject to the provisions of paragraph eight. Purchaser's deposit shall be refunded in full I won't, that's the same as in almost every paragraph here. For purposes of this paragraph, purchaser is deemed to have received a copy of the appraisal when purchaser is notified in writing of the appraised value of the property. If purchaser does not request a reduction in the purchase price within five days after receipt of the appraisal, then this condition shall be deemed waived by purchaser, which means they're moving forward to settlement with the below, uh, or with the low appraisal, okay? Questions on that. If this agreement is conditioned upon purchaser obtaining financing, purchasers shall make written application for such loan within seven days after the date of ratification and shall make diligent effort to secure a written loan commitment no later than 5 p.m. on the settlement date. This is what uh, Michael was talking about. Set forth in paragraph nine. If at the time of such loan application, purchaser chooses not to lock in 
the rate and or points that meet or exceed the requirements set forth in paragraph four, purchaser waives such rate and point contingency. So that's huge. So if you put in uh, three and a quarter up there and the rate is three and a quarter or three and an eighth or whatever, when you're making loan application and you don't lock in and it goes up, well, then you need to go to what it goes up to. You don't get to get out because it went above because you had your shot at locking in at the interest rate you asked for up in paragraph four. If this agreement is not conditioned upon purchaser obtaining financing, purchaser shall provide seller with written verification from a third party in possession of purchaser's assets within seven days after the date of ratification that purchaser has sufficient assets to pay the balance of the purchase price at settlement. If purchaser fails to comply with any of the provisions of this paragraph or fails to obtain a written loan commitment by 5 p.m. on the settlement date, then seller may terminate this agreement by written notice to purchaser and subject to the provisions of paragraph eight, purchaser's deposit shall be refunded to purchaser. Um, as used in this paragraph, diligent effort shall mean that purchaser uh, has provided all information or documentation requested by a lender within seven days of each such request and paid all costs associated with such loan application, including but not limited to application fees, credit reports, and appraisals. Purchaser authorizes the lender to disclose to the listing broker and selling broker information about the progress of purchaser's loan application and approval, including whether purchaser has complied with the lender's request and paid all costs associated with such application and furnish a copy of purchaser's loan estimate and closing disclosure to the selling broker. If, to, if after diligent effort purchaser is unable to obtain financing, then this agreement shall terminate and subject to the provisions of paragraph eight, purchaser's deposit shall be refunded in full to purchaser and neither party shall have any further obligation here under. Um, please let your buyers know up front, and hopefully the lender will also, you know, there's gonna be a lot of stuff that that lender's asking for. I actually know right now because uh, we're buying a, an investment property and so I'm going through the loan process right now and they ask for pretty much everything under the sun, it seems like. So, um, but diligent effort, they've got to have that to them within seven days um, or they are um, possibly in, they could possibly be found in default. So wire fraud alert, uh, you can figure that out on your own. Um, deposit, purchaser shall make a, a deposit of, so you put in the amount here to be held by, remember Keller Williams, we do not hold deposits, uh, EMDs. So it would not be us. I would recommend you have a title company hold it. Um, so, and hopefully that's Vesta, if you're uh, working with, with John there. So uh, in the form of a check, which most people do, cash or other, uh, purchaser shall, our purchaser either has paid the deposit, which is normally not the case, to the escrow agent or will pay the deposit to the escrow agent within blank days, three to five days or something like that is what I normally see. Um, now, let me just tell you, I would recommend to you that you not be the one to take that check. They, most of these people now have the, or most of these companies have the ability, give the buyer the ability to be able to do it through an app on their phone or something like that. But to reduce your liability, I would recommend that you not be the one that actually get the check from the buyer and have to deliver it to the uh, title company or wherever it's going. Um, again, reduce your liability whenever you can. So, uh, because if you take that check and then you don't get it in there on time, you have now one, created liability for your buyer um, because they could be, the, the um, contract could be voidable by the seller, but also you have now put yourself in jeopardy of a Virginia Real Estate Board reg regulatory violation. So um, anyway, you don't want to be in that position. So um, I'm not, just to let you know, I'm not going to read the rest of that paragraph. The big thing is that whatever that EMD is, it goes towards the purchase price, goes towards the down payment by the, um, by the buyer. Settlement possession. 
Settlement shall be made at the offices of, the buyer gets to decide where they are going to settle. Um, so that's what would be put in here. Um, on or before, and they select a box here. So box number one, they would put the date or a reasonable time thereafter if purchaser or seller is making diligent effort to satisfy any contingencies contained in this agreement or the second one here, uh, and subject to seller's right to cure any title defects as set forth in paragraph 24B, if settlement does not occur with, oh, excuse me, within 10 days following such date, a party who is ready, willing, and able to close under the terms of this agreement may terminate this agreement by written notice to the other party and subject to the provisions of paragraph eight. Purchaser's deposit shall be refunded in full and neither party shall have any further obligation here under. What are y'all seeing checked the most or used the most, the first or the second? The first one. The first one? Everybody kind of agree with that? Yeah, okay, dope. Possession of the property shall be given at settlement unless otherwise agreed in writing by the parties. Failure to check one box above shall not invalidate this agreement. The settlement date shall be as of inserted above. Seller and purchaser authorize and direct the settlement agent to provide a copy of purchaser's closing disclosure, uh, settlement statement and or disbursement summary for this transaction, the seller, purchaser, listing broker and selling broker. This part about possession, settlement is when the paperwork's been done or done and the deed has been signed. It's not when the seller gets their money or when it's been recorded. We've had, I know here in the last couple of weeks, we had one seller down there that said, oh no, you're not getting the keys until um, I get my money. Well, we had the seller, you know, so was something else put in writing here in this contract? And it was not. So finally the seller um, did give in and uh, provide the keys, but I just, that one, you know, it's fresh in my mind. So just make sure that your, your seller understands, especially I hate to say if it's a, an older client, the seller is an older client. It used to be that, you know, settlement happened while they were still sitting at the table, the, the, they would go and record it and come back and hand the seller a check and everything was good. That doesn't happen hardly at all anymore. Um, so set their expectations up front when they are, you know, if they want their money before the keys are given, well, then that needs to be worked out before the contract is ratified. Uh, all the parties need to agree to that because the contract doesn't say that. The contract says possession is basically going to take place the day that everybody has sat down and signed paperwork, um, the seller being the deed and the buyer being the loan docs and closing docs. So, okay. Add that there's a, I know there are some sellers out there that purposely modify that part of our contract and say possession will be at recordation. So just be noted, be, be careful, cautious of that too when you're looking at. Um, yeah, because remember, recordation, they have two business days. So if it's a Friday settlement, then it could be, uh, you know, recorded on Tuesday, um, which, you know, there's four days that they're sitting there with that house, that buyer not being able to move in. Okie doke. Thank you, Michael. Occupancy disclosure, purchaser intends to occupy or not occupy the property uh, as principal residents. Um, pretty simple. Residential property disclosure, is there or is there not one? Um, and if there is one required, then is it attached or not? Um, so if it's not attached or not given, just remember if you're representing the seller, that if it's not provided to the purchaser, the purchaser has up until the time they get that or three days after to basically get out of the contract. So if you want that buyer to be locked in, then make sure that they have this before you're signing the contract and ratifying it. Rick, can I ask a question? Yes. I've never had a case where I, I have not had one signed by the seller. Is, is there a... a a situation where one would not be required ever? Yeah, it's, if it's a, um, the biggest one is where it's an estate. Uh -huh. um, so the owner has died and, you know, it's being sold as an estate or the other place is bank owned properties. 
they're not required for bank owned. So other than that, normally the ones that we're dealing with, you know, it's going to be required because one other one is when it's family selling to family, you don't have to worry about it, but we're not normally not involved in those. So, okay, doke. Fair housing disclosure, y'all know fair housing very well and it's pretty much laid out right here. Um, 13 property, property owners association. I'm not gonna read the whole thing here, but if there is a property owners association that they're gonna check is, um, and then it is the seller's responsibility to get the, the um, those uh, docs ordered so that they can be given to the buyer um, this is the, if it is a property owners association up until they get those documents and three days after it's pretty much the buyer get out of contract free provision. So, um, and to let you know if it is an older association and maybe they are, they're not going to have any documents to send or whatever the case might be, then you need to send notification to that buyer that they are not going to be receiving the property owner association disclosure docs. And then their three days starts ticking at that point. The other thing I wanna point out here is that they only get a piece of the disclosure, not all the documents that are required, their three day clock starts ticking, okay? This can be extended to seven days um, with a written agreement. I'm not really seeing that happening very much. Uh, I've, I've only seen a couple of them so far where they've extended it, but um, it can't be extended past seven days. And to let you know, they, the buyer cannot waive their right to getting them. Condominium disclosure is pretty much the same way. So um, anyway, I'm not going to read that big long paragraph. Um, owners Association repairs. If a disclosure packet... Uh, oh, you, you also may have both a condo and a property owner's oh, yeah. association. Yeah. Yeah. There's a few, a few developments that will have both. I should be looking down at what I've got on my thing here because I've got that written down on, on what I've got below me, but I'm reading what's on the screen. So thank you, Michael. So, <laughs> um, Owner's association repairs if a disclosure packet, resale certificate, or inspection report from a property or condominium owners association indicates the property is not in compliance with the association's governing documents, then purchaser may request in writing within five days from receipt of any such disclosure packet, resale certificate or inspection report that seller at seller's expense make any repairs, perform any maintenance or take any corrective action required to conform the property to the association's requirements prior to settlement. If any such repairs, maintenance, or corrective action is not performed prior to settlement, then purchaser may terminate this agreement by written notice to seller. And subject to the provisions of paragraph eight, purchaser's deposit will be refunded in full, blah, 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 blah. If purchaser does not make a written request to seller within five days after receipt of disclosure packet, uh, resale certificate, so on and so forth, then purchaser's right to make such request to seller or to terminate this agreement shall be deemed waived. So that is pretty big. So make sure if there are problems that your purchaser knows that if they want to have them fixed or have the ability to get out, they need to request that the seller take care of those. If they don't do that within five days, then they're waiving uh, their right to get them fixed and to get out of the contract because they're, if they're not fixed. Property inspection. So now we're into the big one here. Um, purchaser waives a property inspection of the property or um, seller hereby grants the purchaser the right to have the property inspected by a licensed home inspector or other person selected by purchaser or at purchaser's expense and to request repair of uh, defects revealed and or a seller paid closing cost credit to purchaser. Um, purchasers requested repairs and seller paid closing cost credit shall be collectively referred to herein as the repair request. Inspections um, may include, but are not limited to, all structural and building components and systems, radon 
gas, underground storage tanks, soil condition, environmental testing, and engineering studies. The term defects as used in this paragraph 16 shall mean a condition which impairs the normal stability, safety, or use of any improvements, um, buildings, or property, or damage to any part of the improvements, but shall exclude any cosmetic flaws, antiquated systems, or grandfathered components that are in working order, but would not comply with current building code if constructed or installed today. If a system or component is near, at, or beyond its projected life expectancy, but is properly functioning, then such system or component will not be deemed a defect as defined herein. And so therefore the buyer cannot ask that it be corrected um, under, in the repair request. So that is huge that they describe what, what a defect is, okay? Purchaser, purchaser shall provide seller with all inspection reports, cost of repairs and purchaser's written repair request no later than, you pick, pick one here, uh, blank days after date of ratification or blank AM or PM on a specific date. I would normally pick number of days after the date of ratification because um, you, if you pick, you know, 5 p.m., five days from the date you're making the offer, and it takes four days to get it ratified, well, now you've only got one day to, um, you know, get your home inspection done. So I would do it so many days after date of ratification. If no box is checked, the inspection deadline shall be 10 days after the date of ratification. Uh, in the repair request, Purchaser reserves the right to request certain repairs be performed by a contractor currently licensed by the Virginia Board of Contractors, but shall not request seller to perform any inspections of the property. If purchaser does not submit to seller all inspection reports, cost of repairs, and the repair request by the inspection deadline, then purchaser waives the right to request repairs and or seller paid closing cost credit uh, and agrees that the present condition of the property is satisfactory and will proceed to settlement in accordance with the purchase, pre or purchase agreement. Um, seller shall respond in writing to purchaser's repair request within seven days of this receipt. Uh, that's called the negotiation period. If seller agrees in writing to accept such repair request, then the party shall proceed to settlement. If seller does not respond in writing within negotiation period, then seller uh, shall be deemed to have rejected purchaser's repair request. Let me just cover something up in here real quick. Make sure that you send a full copy of the report, not just the items that, you know, the summary page or something like that, along with the repair request and everything. Sometimes agents are sloppy and they don't send the whole thing. If they don't send the whole thing, then it could, it can be deemed or should be deemed that they have waived their right to ask for any of that. Okay, dope. And something special to highlight with that that is kind of glossed over in this paragraph. You have an inspection time period, 10 days or 14 days or whatever you determine it is. That's not just the time for you to do the inspection. That's also the time that you need to submit the report and request. So if you get inspection, if you have 10 days, inspection happens on day 10, you better get that inspection report and request that same day. Yes. Yeah. So if you're going for 10 days, I would recommend that you be trying to have that home inspection within seven or eight, because if you're going to need to repair request, um, you know, and you need to get somebody else maybe back in to look at it, to give you a quote on that, then you don't want to be waiting to the last day. Hey, Rick, uh, James has a question. Okay, no. Go James. James, I was wondering what's best practices for handling after the inspector has gone through and those things that he's not able to, I guess you could say comment on, but he'll refer you to someone, maybe it's foundation, chimney, things like that, uh, both to you and Mike, how best to handle that given the time frame that you've given, if there's an additional inspection that might be needed. Well, and again, that's kind of to that point is you need to try and have more, have your home inspection as early as possible or give yourself enough days that you can then, you know, get somebody else out there to check those things. Um, 
Yeah. Well, you know, in this market right now, it is a little tough though, because the sellers, exactly. they want the time period as short as possible so that if you're not going to get it, they can move on to the next. Um, so it's kind of a, a little dance that you're trying to do here um, in order to do that. Um, best way on the ask for an extension? Is that that's the best way to handle that, Mike? For Rick? I, the problem is they don't have to grant you that extension. Correct, correct. Michael, what were you going to say? I see you. Yeah, I would say good luck on getting an extension, yeah. especially in this market. Right, yeah. uh, the, other, the other thing you need to consider is what type of inspection and where we are, where are we in the market? So like for the last two years plus, good luck in trying to get a, a, a chimney inspection done right. within three or four months. <laughs> so that's just a, you know, it's, you know, and HVAC, yeah, maybe you might get, be able to get an HVAC person in there to, to check things over. But uh, yeah, like chimney inspection, you're not getting one for three or four months. That was just citing it. It could be any other thing if the inspector has noticed that he could only suggest. So what's the solution, if any? I just want to know which way. Um, I think it helps to build relationships with, with the different contractors and already have that rapport built where if you need like a favor and somebody to try and get in there quick, they may be able to accommodate you. Okay. I mean, that, that, that's helpful. And I usually, when I get a ratified contract, I turn right around with my client and we're scheduling that inspection. I try to do it the, the same week if that inspector is available. Yeah. Okay. One thing just to let you know, um, don't, my really good friend is a home inspector and he says, you know, a lot of agents, they will um, set up a, a home inspection or they have in the past they'll try and set up a home inspection before they've even made an offer and then if they don't get it they just cancel he said unfortunately don't do that to him too many times because he's not going to set up any in the future um, mm -hmm. until you can show that you've got a contract because it's just you know wasting his time uh to be setting things up to then not have one so michael or, or let them know that ahead of time say hey yes. we're submitting a contract when do you have an inspection available okay can you pencil us in and most home inspectors are willing to accept something like that, especially if you can, if, if you're, if you can cancel you know, two or three days ahead of time, if there's still plenty of time, they're, they're, yeah. they're, they'll, they'll give you a lot of grace there. Yeah, yeah. And again, that's kind of building that rapport, like uh, Burnett says, you know, building the, re the rapport with the home inspectors and the contractors and everything. Um, so, uh, but. Right. I got it. Yep, yep. But it's, I mean, again, in this market these days, it is really hard to, you know, to get an extension. It's almost like hitting the lottery to have a seller that's willing to give an extension for that. So, um, you know, it's just get that thing as early as possible, um, the home inspection. So let's see, where did I... Um, so if purchaser's repair request is not accepted by seller, then the parties may continue to negotiate the terms of the repair request during the negotiation period. Once a party rejects an offer or presents a counter offer to the other party, then all prior offers and counter offers made by either party regarding the repair request shall be deemed rejected so that only one repair request offer or counter offer at a time shall be considered. Seller may or seller may not require purchaser to accept a seller paid closing cost credit to purchaser in lieu of repairs requested by purchaser. Further, no party may unilaterally terminate this agreement during the negotiation period, except to pursuant to uh, the optional paragraph below. Another thing just to warn you about with um, seller credits, if it's to repair something, there are some lenders that may find may have problems with that. So before you go and get a credit to get something repaired after settlement or whatever, you need to make sure that the lender is going to be okay with that. If by 5 p.m. on the seventh day of the negotiation period, no final agreement is reached as to the repair request, then purchaser, purchaser shall have until 5 p.m. the second day after the end of the negotiation period to either terminate this agreement by written notice to seller or accept in writing seller's last offer regarding the repair request and proceed to settlement. If purchaser terminates this agreement or fails to notify seller of its election within the said two day period, then this agreement shall terminate 
and subject to the provisions of paragraph eight, purchaser's deposit shall be re refunded to purchaser and neither party shall have any further obligation here under. So um, basically if the purchaser wants to move forward, they have to put that in writing because if they don't, it's this contract's automatically gonna terminate. Okie doke. I had one more thing to add on what your little footnote there, uh, Rick, about closing cost credits. Okay. If you already have closing cost credits under paragraph two, three with financing, bottom of page one, you have to be careful with the loan program as to how many, how much in closing credits that you can rec receive because each program has a different limit of closing costs. Well, not just closing cost credits, but third party contributions, I should right. say. Yep. Yep. Because that could be involved. That could include a gift uh, letter. <laughs> well, no, it won't include gift letters, but it no, would that's include right. yeah. lender credits. It could include realtor credits, those sort of things. So just be careful with those numbers. So all repairs pursuant to program. Oh, the one thing I did that I didn't point out up here or wanted to just cover is just to make sure you understand up here at the top, we're talking about the defects, um, is you know, if the if the home inspector says, well, this isn't up to code, if it were to code when it was built, or when that if there was a um, repair done or whatever, if it was to code to then, it doesn't matter that it's not to code now. Um, you know, it it's not a defect. So uh, and also if if a just because a home inspector might call it a quote defect does not necessarily mean it matches the definition in our contract. In the defect. contract. Yeah, hopefully the home inspectors that you're using know the contract well and so that they don't make that kind of misnomer if you would. Um, all repairs pursuant to paragraph 16 shall be made in a workmanlike manner prior to settlement or such other time as agreed to by the parties. Unless otherwise agreed to by the party, seller shall provide purchaser with paid receipts for all repairs prior to settlement, or if repairs are to be paid from seller's proceeds, seller shall provide written invoices to purchaser uh, and the settlement agent directing disbursement of seller's proceeds for payment of said invoices. Optional paragraph, this paragraph is or is not applicable. So pick one there. If no box is checked, then this paragraph is not applicable. If this paragraph is applicable and purchaser is dissatisfied with their inspection results of the property, then in lieu of submitting a repair request to seller, purchaser may instead terminate this agreement by written notice to seller prior to the inspection deadline, provided, however, if purchaser submits a repair request to seller, then purchaser waives their right to terminate this agreement pursuant to this paragraph and agrees to proceed with, proceed with the negotiation of the repair request as set forth above. If purchaser terminates this agreement in accordance with this paragraph, then subject to the provisions of paragraph eight, purchaser's deposit shall be refunded in full to purchaser and neither party shall have any further obligation here under. Um, how many of y'all are seeing this be applicable? Are you seeing it much? No. No. In today's market, I'm kind of surprised that it's not being used more maybe, but anyway. Um, seller ha shall have all utilities supplied to all systems prior to inspection. If seller fails to have all utilities supplied to uh, all systems prior to purchaser's inspection, then the expiration of the inspection period set forth above shall be extended. Um, until 10 days following the date that purchaser is notified by seller that all utilities have been supplied to all systems. Purchaser and seller, the heirs and the signs hereby jointly and separately release and forever discharge the listing and selling brokers. I want to say, I'm not going to worry about that, that part too awful much. Purchaser and seller acknowledge that the provisions of this paragraph 16 are in addition to treatments or repairs made pursuant to paragraphs 15, 24E, 24F, and 24G, which is you know, pest inspection and things like that. I have a question. Yes. So 
do we are we to rely on those receipts as confirmation that the work was done satisfactorily or is it recommended that we get another inspection to make sure they were done and I, I hate to say I think that probably depends on your purchaser maybe what work is being done okay. um, especially if the work because it says that it's recommended that things are done by a contractor right it's not guaranteed I mean I would recommend that all work I would put in there that all work be done by a contractor because mm -hmm. then if it's not done properly you can go back after the contractor about not getting it done okay. uh, if you if you depend on the seller to Harry homeowner it, um, then you're going to have a bigger fight if they're not going to, if it's not done correctly and the chances of it not being done correctly are probably higher. Okay. Um, okay. And, and request those receipts, uh, prior to settlement. And you can get a, you know, you can go back in and, and have a home inspector look to see if the things were done properly, but you don't get the right to ask for more things. Right. Right. Understood. Yeah. Okay. We actually just had one in the last couple of weeks um, that they were, they asked for that inspection and then they came back and they asked for additional thing work to be done. And we're like, nope, I uh, can't do that. So. Default, I will point this one out here. Uh, if either seller or purchaser defaults under this agreement, the defaulting party, excuse me, in addition to all other remedies available at law or in equity, shall be liable for the brokerage fees set forth in paragraph 19 and any brokerage fees set forth in seller's uh, listing agreement with the list, excuse me, with the listing broker for the property um, as set or as if this agreement and seller's listing agreement had been performed and for any damages and all expenses incurred by a non-defaulting party. The listing broker and selling broker in connection with this transaction and the enforcement of this agreement and seller's listing agreement, including without limitation attorney's fees and court costs. Payment of a real estate broker's fee as a result of a transaction relating to the property which occurs subsequent to a default under this agreement shall not relieve the defaulting party of liability for any brokerage fees due under this agreement or seller's listing agreement or for any damages and expenses, including attorney's fees and court costs incurred by the non-defaulting party, the listing broker, and the selling broker in connection with this transaction. This is huge. We've actually, got, we're kind of in the middle of one of these down at Richmond West right now, where the buyer um, didn't go to settlement as in default. And there's probably a decent chance that um, the we're gonna be going after them for this and the seller's going after them. Again, this says, that if the basically if the you know defaulting part they don't go to settlement, then they could owe all the commissions to both sides, um, along with other damages, court costs, attorneys' fees, everything like that. Even if that proper that property sells subsequent to their default, um, and all those commissions are earned, it could be basically double commissions earned. So that is huge to point out to somebody if they are point that paragraph out don't try and give them legal advice but point that paragraph out to them and tell them you had better seek legal counsel before you think about just not showing up at settlement <laughs> okay nope because that's a pretty stiff penalty so somebody have a question or i thought i heard so this next paragraph choice of settlement agent the buyer gets to choose who their settlement agent is, even if agreed in writing that they are, that they're gonna use ABC title company or settlement company, they can change their mind um, and use XYZ settlement company. Um, where this is huge is, um, it really kind of came, that second part there came in existence in like 08, 09 timeframe when um, there were a lot of um, bank owned properties being sold and the banks were saying, you will use our title company to settle. Um, the Virginia legislature said, oh no, uh, the buyer still has the right, even if agreed to in writing that they're going to use 
you know, uh, somebody else, they can change their mind and use who they wish. So the seller can't force a buyer to use their title company or settlement company. Now, what I do want to point out is, especially with new homes, they'll say, if you use my settlement company, we will give you a free deck. We will credit X amount towards your closing or whatever the case might be. They, those incentives, they can take away if you don't use their, their settlement company. Brokerage fee, I'm not going to worry about covering that. Home warranty uh, insurance. Um, so purchaser has been advised of the availability of a one-year home warranty program and either declines or elects to purchase. Um, I mean, the sponsor of this thing today was Cinch Home Warranty which used to be HMS. Um, the cost of that home warranty program of the, and you're, if it was since you would put that is and put the amount uh, to be paid by either the purchaser or seller. Make sure that they check either declines coverage or elects coverage, because let me just let you know, errors and emissions insurance. We have errors and emissions insurance policies for everybody in our office. Um, the current, program that we've got, there is a $2,500 deductible that the agent would be required to pay if we have to use the e o insurance to cover us for something uh, for a transaction that you were involved in. So, but we've also negotiated that if four different things take place for, I hold up my whole hand, five fingers, that's good. So if four things take place um, or are provided, that deduct, that $2,500 um, could be waived. Um, so that to, to waive that deductible, you need to use um, association provided forms. That's what we're looking at here, but make sure you're not using you know, a non-association um, form and it has to be the current form. So don't be using dated forms that aren't uh, you know, being used anymore. That's number one. Number two, a home inspection was offered. So um, if it's offered and declined, you know, this is paragraph 20 here is proof that it was offered. If they check declined, well then that's fine. It was offered to them, but they declined it. If they got one, then that's fine. Uh, the next thing is that the home, um, and that the residential property disclosure was uh, provided. If it's required, I will let you know, I had to go to bet. We had one where it was not required. It was a, uh, a bank owned property. And they said, you know, well, we can't waive the, the deductible because it wasn't provided. I had to show them uh, Virginia law does not require it. So then they did agree that that, wouldn't, that one was not required anymore. Uh, and the fourth thing is that a home inspection was offered or done. So um, it's very important in that home inspection paragraph to show that it was either done or offered to them or declined. So if you've got those four things, then you should be able to get that deductible waived. And we have been able to do that uh, multiple times. Just wanted to kind of point that out to you. Hey, Rick, oh, we've got a question here. Okay. Hey, this is James. In the event that a buyer changes their mind after saying they would get the warranty, is there a form that they need to sign after that fact? I would recommend that you get them to sign something that they, you know, they hereby waive their right to get that home warranty. Is there a form out there, Mike, that I'm just not aware of? Not for that, I don't believe. Michael, do you know of one to, for changing your mind? I guess it could be an amendment to the... No, there, okay. there isn't a form. The other thing that I would add is that all of the, or at least I would say probably 95% of the home warranty companies, their forms are in their in transaction desk. So if you're yes. looking at a price, if you're wanting to know what the price of the home warranty is, go to the application in the in transaction desk and you can figure out what the pricing is on that. The question specific, specifically is, if they change their mind after the contract has been ratified, where they say they would get a warranty, and now they say, no, I no longer want to have a warranty. So we haven't gotten the settlement yet, but they've changed their mind. Um, There's no form. Yeah. You can, you can just put that into, 
the, the, the challenge is that, so when a title company, when a settlement agent is looking at the contract, they're going to ask you, well, where's the, if, it, if they said yes, and the yep. buyer is purchasing it, they're going to say, where's the receipt for this? Or do we need to purchase it at settlement? And so I would have something in writing, whether it be an email or something, oh, we don't want a home warranty anymore. Right. I got it, got it covered. Yep. Um, while I think about it, um, talking about all these different type things, please, because one thing that we've had multiple different times um, is where agents have a, a verbal you know, agreement or a, a verbal discussion with their client and, you know, um, our latest one was uh, there was going in it's up in Northern Virginia, but these, the seller, there were problems with a pool. Um, and so the, the buyer had requested that it be fixed and the seller uh, said, yes, go ahead and have it fixed. Um, they got, or they got a quote for, for it. And I think it was $8,100 to, to have the problem fixed. The seller uh, told the agent, yes, go ahead and get that taken care of with the person that you got the quote from. So the agent said, you know, okay, it's a go. And, but didn't follow up with it in writing. Then after the work was done, the seller said, I never authorized that to be done. And so you agent and Keller Williams gonna have to pay that $8,100 because I didn't authorize it. So if you've got any type of thing like that, where any agreement was made um, between you and your client, um, follow that up with a text or an email just to confirm our conversation today, you agreed for me to go ahead and you know get the $8,100 uh, worth of work done on the pool. If they don't uh, reply back, no, I didn't agree to that, then that should cover you uh, if it has to go to court or something. But um, please, I, and that's not the only case, we get at least one of those a month um, where that type thing happens and they're normally pretty ugly. Uh, the he said, she said. So, and I, I hate to say in our current environment, there are a lot of people that they are not people of their word. Um, so they will agree to things and then turn around and, and change their mind. Um, so let's see, additional terms, that's just where, um, you know, something that's not covered up in here, um, somewhere else, you might wanna put that. Um, Expense prorations are going to be as of settlement. Uh, title, title is, it's supposed to be a general warranty deed. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Just to let you know, there are title problems in a lot of uh, settlements. But they're normally very minor. And the title companies, they get them worked out you know, very quick and easily. So don't freak out if you find out that there's a title issue ask the title company before you start getting everybody all wound up. Ask, is this going to be one that's going to delay settlement? You know, something like that. Uh, normally the case is no. Um, the title company will let you know whether it's a big issue or not. So um, please, uh, settlements are stressful enough without us winding them up, uh, you know, without calls. Um, Land use assessment, this one, you, you know, if it's a rural property, you're normally not going to see this unless it's greater than five acres. Uh, and then there is a chance um, that it could be land use. Just to let you know, land use is a reduction in um, the real estate taxes normally due to agricultural use. Um, and yet that, that reduction can, can be pretty big and, it can be rollback taxes. And just to let you know, rollback taxes, they go back six years and look at um, the savings and add on interest and penalties. So I'll just give you, I have, I live on a farm and we've got 10 acre, uh, our property, even though it's a farm, when we bought it, it was already broken into 10 to 25 acre lots. Um, on one of our 10 acre lots, we save about $3,000 a year in land use taxes or in land use. So if we did rollbacks, um, the rollback tax would be in excess of $20,000 that would be owed. Um, so it can be a sizable amount of money that could be owed in rollback taxes. So if you're, 
If the property is does have land with it, please check and see. It will it should say in the tax records whether it's in land use or not. If it is, then this is something that you do need to bring up to your uh, buyers that they need to re-enroll uh, into the program because if they don't, they could owe the rollback taxes. Okay. Question. Question. Yes. And 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 you are required to actively use that as uh, agriculture. Or D depending on what type of program they're in. Okay. There's a lot of different programs because it could be a conservation easement, different things like that. Um, so you need to find out about that program. But just since it can be such a, a large chunk of money, um, definitely one that you want to point out um, if it is in land use. Risk of loss, basically up until settlement, it's a seller and after settlement, it's the buyer. Um, Equipment condition and inspection. Seller shall convey uh, and purchaser agrees to accept the property at settlement in its physical condition at the time, uh, the date of ratification, except as otherwise provided herein. So if there's an inspection done and things were agreed to be fixed, well, then those things need to be fixed. Um, seller warrants that all appliances, heating and cooling equipment, plumbing systems, and electrical systems will be in working order at time of settlement or at purchaser's occupancy, whichever occurs first. Seller agrees to uh, deliver the property in broom clean condition and to exercise reasonable and ordinary care in the maintenance and upkeep of the property between the date of this, or this agreement is executed by seller and settlement or at purchaser's occupancy, or whichever occurs first. Seller grants to purchaser or his representatives the right to make a pre-occupancy or pre-settlement inspection to verify the condition of the property uh, conforms to this agreement and to ensure that repairs, if any, have been completed. Um, just please explain to your buyer that a seller's version of broom clean condition may not be their, um, you know, version of it. Uh, a buyer's version of broom clean is that that seller had a professional company come in and scrub with a toothbrush, everything in the house sometimes, and that is definitely not the seller's version of it. The seller's version of it is there aren't uh, hairballs, you know, rolling around the floor and everything like that, maybe. So um, it's amazing what can cause things to start going sideways. Well, septic or municipal systems, the property is served by a well or a municipal water system. If property is served by a, uh, oh, the property is served by a septic system or a municipal sewage uh, system. Um, or if one or more municipal systems is selected and it is determined prior to settlement by the municipality or a Virginia licensed contractor that the property is not served by such system, then purchaser shall provide the written determination to the seller. The parties may, negotiation, may negotiate the connection of the system uh, upon mutual agreeable terms or within five days following the receipt of such determination. I'm not gonna go into this that much because it doesn't happen that often, um, but just when you're listing a property, if that seller is not getting a bill for water and or sewer, then they probably, it's probably not a municipal system. Just kind of a heads up. So, you know, they're gonna say, oh yeah, I've got public water and sewer. Well, when was the last time you got a bill? I never get a bill. That's probably not the case then. So it may be, but just it's a red flag. If the property is served by well and or septic, seller agrees to furnish purchaser with certificate dated not more than 30 days prior to settlement from a Virginia Department of General Services certified lab indicating that the well water is free from contamination by coliform bacteria and that there is no evidence of malfunction of the septic system. If purchaser obtains a VA loan, the well water shall be, uh, shall also be tested by seller and certified as being free from lead contamination. Inspection of the septic system shall include visual inspection of drain field surface with rod probing, pump contents and visual inspection of distribution box and all tanks, other inspection per manufacturer's guidelines of alternative septic systems. So this needs to be agreed on which it's going to be. 
If well water contamination or septic system malfunctions are found, sellers shall repair all malfunctions and correct the well contamination at seller's expense, subject to the limitation set forth in paragraph H below. Uh, if seller fails to comply with the provisions of this paragraph, then purchaser may utilize the remedy set forth in paragraph 17, accept the property in its current condition or terminate this agreement by written notice to seller and subject to the provisions of paragraph eight. Um, so paragraph, um, so anyway, we'll get down here further and, and see what they're talking about here. Remedy set forth in paragraph 17. Uh, wood infestation, um, seller shall furnish purchaser with an inspection report dated not more than 30 days prior to settlement uh, from a Virginia licensed termite control company concerning the presence of or damage from termites or other wood destroying insects. Um, if the inspection refer or reveals active infestation or damage caused by wood destroying insects, whether past or present, present to the primary dwelling and other dwellings on the property with a valid certificate of occupancy and the following additional structures. So if there's additional structures that you wanna have included, you need to name them here. Seller shall have the affected area treated and have the damage repaired by a reputable company. The treatment company shall furnish a one-year warranty for any such treatment. Um, if seller fails to comply with any provision of this paragraph, purchaser may, again, utilize paragraph 17 and everything just like in the other paragraphs. Um, one thing I would recommend, maybe get, don't wait till right before settlement, but don't do it exactly 30 days before settlement because if things get pushed back a day or two, you don't want these things that say it has to be done uh, valid within 30 days or done within 30 days. So maybe you pick 20 days ahead of settlement to get these inspections done. So paragraph H here, if the total cost of fulfilling seller's repair or treatment obligation set forth in paragraph F and G above exceeds, um, you get to decide what the repair limit is, uh, then seller shall have the option to fulfill seller's obligations and do all the repairs or pay the pay or credit the repair limit to the purchaser and refuse to pay any excess um, of the repair limit. If seller elects option two, purchaser shall have the right to either accept the property in its present condition um, or basically to take the uh, credit. If you don't fill in an amount here, then $1,000 is what's basically put in there. VA and FHA loans, uh, you can read that for yourself. Mechanics, liens, I'm not going to go into that really too awful much. Um, here, non-binding mediation, again, you can read that. It hardly ever takes place. Um, uh, I'm trying to decide if I want to, under miscellaneous, um, it does go into what a day means. You know, a day is a day. It doesn't have to be a uh, business day. Um, and when you're counting days, day number one is the day after, like after ratification. Or if the if you send talking about the home inspection, so you send the uh, repair request to day number one for that negotiation period and everything is uh, the next day. Um, Acceptance, um, this agreement becomes a legally binding agreement only upon ratification of delivery. Unless ratification of delivery of this agreement occurs by blank, you know, 5 a.m. or p.m. or whatever uh, on a particular date, this offer shall expire and shall not be binding on either party. If the parties desire to accept an offer that has expired, then the date set forth in this paragraph must be revised to the ratification date or later. Each party must initial such revision and ratification and delivery must occur prior to the revised expiration date. So that is actually huge when you're looking at, uh, at that paragraph. Any questions or anything on what we covered here? If not, then I am going to thank you all for your time Hey, Michael, is it okay if I give you a call about something? Yeah, I'm uh, doing a showing. 
I'll be, I should be done by 2.30 or so. So after that, give me a call. Oh, okay. Sounds good. I'll talk to you later on. Uh, good luck on your showing. Yeah. One uh, thing I would add on that that uh, is sometimes overlooked with, with what Rick just put there is the acceptance or, the, or, or the, the, the acceptance of that contract is dependent upon not only signing, but delivery. Delivery. So a seller could sign at 10 p.m., but then an agent doesn't deliver it to the other side. That's the delivery until eight o'clock the next morning. You're not ratified until the next day. Correct. Eight o'clock. So, um, so yeah, 8 a.m. is actually ratification of that next day. So day one of that contract is now the following day. Yep. So, yep. Thank you. It's when delivery occurs. Yes. Or, or at least delivery is attempted, I should say, because if it, if, a, if an agent emails it to you and it happens to go into your spam folder, it's still delivered. It's delivered. As long as that the one that's sending it has proof that they sent it, they're good. Yep. 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 So just a heads it, up on that. Yeah. I always try to ask if they would acknowledge receipt. That yeah, way. you can ask that, but well, to the point that, that Michael makes is if they decline, they don't do that. It's right, still right. been it's still been delivered. Okay, um, okay. So that kind of goes back to the old days. Um, it was hand delivery, and the person that's getting the, it delivered to them, they won't answer the door, or they answer the door and say, "I'm not going to take that." Well, you know what? Tough noogies. It's been delivered. <laughs> so yeah. the kind of the same with that person who says, "Oh, I'm not going to do the read receipt because then it's not delivered to me." Wrong. Right. It's right. Yeah. yeah. Hey, hey, Mike. I, I left you a message. I was trying to get an answer, but I got my answer. Uh, last night, just in case it was, I just wanted to get clarification. I have a ratified contract and we've got a rent back, but I wanted clarification on how that uh, money is managed for the rent back payment, but I got an answer. Thanks. Good. Cool. Thank Almost you everybody. And go out there and sell, sell, sell. Thanks, Rick. Have a great one. You too, Rick. Thanks. Okay. Bye.